So maybe we'll just kick it off here. Um, I really enjoyed, thank you guys again for coming and you know, tackling you know, these topics. And not only did you guys help the principal, but you also again highlighted where we need to go. It's a very exciting stuff. For the sake of kind of bringing it back, um, obviously there were many key points in your talk. In your talk. Um, maybe you could each just highlight the one thing that you'd want this audience to leave from your talk. Like, what is your one key point? And obviously, there are many. But if you had to pick one that you wanted them to walk away today with, your pet peeve or your, you know, your the, the, the thing you want to get out there, maybe we'll start with each and then just go towards the sales speaker. I think I thanks, Walter. I, I think I could sum it up by saying that we have yet to really master the basics in uh, the care for acute pancreatitis, and I, there's been a lot of progress in management of complex, complicated care, but in terms of optimizing how we provide the basics is where we need to make progress. Thank you. I, you didn't prepare us that we have to give one main point, um, but what I would say on the fly, since we're all in one room, um, it, it is the time that we recognize our you know, um, advances in knowledge and limitation when it comes to the pediatric pancreas world, we got to put our hands together. And this is a, not just a plea to you know, funding and industry, but it's very sad when we get one line response and saying, your project is great. It's going to look at MRCP and endocrine pancreatic function testing in children, but we're not interested in pediatric disease. It's just, it, it, is, a, it is not time to increase awareness that it's been neglected so long that there is a fun, um, a growth in knowledge and knowing how much it affects the, de the, the lives of people and results in complications and loss, even chance to let them grow and reach their best potential that we could put our hands together and try to understand it better. Yeah. Thank you, Walter. Uh, I would say risk factors and recurrent acute pancreatitis should diagnose or should be preferred in the diagnosis of early or mild chronic pancreatitis over diagnostic imaging studies. I thought you were going to say think pickle juice. Think pickle juice. <laughs> that was a great slide. Uh, I would say that uh, the take home is that pancreas cancer is the worst of all cancers. There's a, there's a lot of room uh, for improvement, and that every patient that has pancreas cancer should be offered participation in a clinical trial. Great. Question? Um, I excellent questions. So when we um, wanted to put recommendations of how should we manage a child with acute pancreatitis, we reviewed extensively the literature and we came up with recommendations that the ultrasound, at least in the first attack of every um, um, child of acute pancreatitis should be performed to look for um, either confirming the diagnosis, looking for complications, which we know the ultrasound is not the best modality, but really to look for gallstones so that they're not letting we're not letting them go with that ruling, like the case that I mentioned, which is a true case, and there's many others. Um, obesity was not a, a risk factor when we compared gallstone acute pancreatitis compared to all comers. However, when we published that series, it was a relatively small N, um, about 120 patients. So maybe we cannot make that conclusion. So it's not only in the obese, it does happen in normal weight and underweight kids, and it has been seen in less. So other factors are cardiac comorbidities, having been on TPM for any risk factor on, in their neonate period, um, then be aware that they could have, and we've seen gallstone pancreatitis without really being able to define why. I want to pick up on a concept that Mindson brought up as well, and we can catch it a little bit about the idiopathic DTI. And of course, in Fred time here, I mean, we kind of speak to each other now again about how we historically and think about Insufficiency to the loss of cells, and we have to do 90%. But 
But I think it struck me because I think for those of us who have pancreas clinics, we are referred these patients who have a very normal looking pancreas and otherwise seem to behave like they have scatteria. Um, maybe it's not pancreatic clot. Thoughts about how you approach that? What are your, um, what goes through your mind as you kind of think through these topics? Um, maybe like some of them that I, I agree with you. So the patients come because they want to know, is there sciatoria and diarrhea? So two questions that the patients have, is it really EPI? So if you do an indirect testing, we're not helping them. And that's what the test group um, is summarizing. So really at this point, you're going to cut the chase. Look, they already have fecal elastase and fecal fat. Perform a direct pancreatic function testing. And there's no ideal test, but I go to both together because we still don't know which one is better endoscopic with an MR pancreatic function testing, a quantitative, not a qualitative test. So we measure the volume when we have normals and healthy and controlled. Um, then you answer, do they have EPI or not? And then you start looking at etiology. So when I look at etiologies, I think, have you ever had pancreatitis? And we look at that, still keep an open mind. And if really their pancreas looks normal and they never had abdominal pain or elevated amyloid and lipase, it's probably not pancreatitis. Then I we go to cystic fibrosis, start with a sweat chloride before genetic testing. We do have, because we're pediatricians, a pancreatic insufficiency panel that just kind of lumps the most common genes, and definitely there's room for expansion as we know more. So it lists the congenital syndrome, cystic fibrosis, Schwachmann diamond is the second most common cause, and then the other uh, weirder or less uh, common, Pearson marrow and others. Um, Autoimmune pancreatitis in children is more aggressive, so they might have had it and then lost function. But we have a Schwachmann diamond light. The gene is negative, and they really have exocrine insufficiency by testing, and they only perform with uh, pancreatic enzymes. Yeah, historically, we've been using the direct pancreatic function test, so the tikr and stimulated um, stimulation of, of pancreatic fluid uh, and then uh, you know, collecting that through the uh, do a I mean, the gastroscope in order, in order to assay for bicarbonate concentrations. However, um, I would actually say I think it's important if you don't think the EPI or an EPI-like EPI state is coming from the pancreas, I think it's important to look for other causes, you know, everything from inflammatory bowel disease, uh, patients who've had upper gastrointestinal tract surgery, small bowel lymphoma, Whipple's disease. There's lots of things that actually can do it. So I think you really behoove to look for all of those things. And that may not be so pancreas-centric, right? So you've got to look for some of these other causes. And you'll often find them. In fact, I just saw somebody a few weeks ago with uh, really bad jejunal Crohn's disease. So they can come in and look like they've got EPI, but pancreas is normal if you image them. So, but I do think that uh, we, there's a lot of room for coming up with a better test to diagnose pancreas insufficiency. And I think one of the most promising ones that's out there is the one that was developed uh, by Virginia Stallings and is still in early stage development, but is known as the malabsorption blood test. I think that for those who are interested in the area, I think it's certainly something uh, worth exploring and looking into that because I think that one day will hopefully become the gold standard. Can you can you comment that you didn't mention giving a therapeutic approach in your lectures? I'm sorry, I, I couldn't understand you. Can you repeat the question? Oh, yes. For treatment of pancreatic cancer. And uh, you, you see any role of uh, sort of synergy with IBO in treatment? We know that pancreatic cancer is a bit local in suppression. That's what failures and migration of T cells. And um, in the slides that you presented, it, it wasn't clear to me. Do you choose one antigen or one more than one antigen? And we, I didn't see, I see that surviving NYSO, so, but do you do also mesotelic in your pool? Yes. Good question. So the, the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes is a, is a hot topic. One of the things that we can do with these cells is they have a marker on them. And so the ones that have been treated and then we take to surgery, we can see that the, the T cells are, that we've engineered are migrating to the tumor and infiltrating into the tumor, uh, which is really, really pretty interesting. Um, choosing the right antigen is, is really the, a hard thing. And mesothelin is one uh, that we uh, looked at um, uh, early on. We were using uh, one called prostate-specific PFCA, uh, but mesothelin is one that's expressed on numerous pancreas cancer cells and not on other tissues. So that was a that was one that we also.
also looked at. But yeah, these, these cells uh, in the current trial, uh, all of those are, are being manufactured at the same time, given at the same time. Because my understanding is that the human mutate, and even initially, if you treat the fields, they will recognize some of the antigens, and later on they don't. That's why you move the antigens. Yep. So I ask you, as equally, can you, do you think there is any value in uh, on the synergy of using IBO inhibitors in conjunction with CAR T cells? Yeah, we're, we're not currently doing that, but that, that's a great idea. They're, they're, that may be a great approach. And uh, my last question is, do you see any role for homeric transplant for stage four cancer? There are some papers from the group of Karolinska, uh, Marcus Maurer, in which he has, uh, I think, nine years of violence, two patients. Yeah, I... I so know it's really drastic, but yeah. uh, with an advanced stage four, you have nothing to offer to those patients. Yeah, a lot of those patients are so weak, it, I, I, would, I would think that would be really, really tough to pull off. Um, but an interesting idea, I've not, I don't know anything about that. Thank you. We have one more question. I just have a question about um, and you may have mentioned it on my but in observation of our family, as your caretaker who has noticed um, the effect of that bomb, and also, um, there seems to be some kind of um, uh, connection between uh, adolescent hormones <laughs> and also in menopause. How have, is that going to address hormones or menopause? Yeah, that's actually a very interesting question. Uh, you know, about 17 years ago, there was. Uh, a pediatric pulmonologist at Hopkins who, who showed that actually young women with CF tended to have more flares, not only of their pulmonary disease, but those who had a history of acute recurrent pancreatitis, in fact, had additional flares of pancreatitis around the time of menses. And it, it has been shown that actually estrogen does inhibit the CFTR channel. So what's interesting is that actually has numerous applications because also women who are on hormone replacement women who are on birth control pills may be developing pancreatitis or a small subset of them are developing pancreatitis because of that CFTR inhibition. So it is interesting. There is some mechanistic plausibility. And I can say every year, I probably see about half a dozen young women who come in with acute pancreatitis and I can't find anything. But then I ask them, like, how long have you been on birth control pills? They're like, oh, four or five years. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> and, and so the correlation is there. Um, I, I think we need to understand that a little bit better, but you, you have hit on something that's really important. Any other comments from the panel? Questions about the microbiome, perhaps something? Okay. Um, well, I want to thank the, the panelists again for a wonderful first session. Thank you very much. And we'll go ahead and take a break now.